we talked about diffraction from double slits, single slits. And now we're going to talk about diffraction through a circular aperture or circular opening. Aperture just means opening. Um, diffraction through circular apertures happens in telescopes. You've got a circular opening. Happens in microscopes. You've got a circular opening. Happens in our eyes. We've got the circular opening of our pupil. Um, we'll talk more about the optics of our eyes later. But diffraction is also happening inside our eyes, and it impacts our ability to resolve distant objects, which we're also going to talk about here. So when light passes through a circular aperture, it spreads out to generate a circular diffraction pattern like this. So we don't have those vertical bright and dark fringes like we do from the double or single slit. We have a circular pattern, a concentric pattern. So we've got a broad central bright maxima, and then we've got these rings of dark minima, destructive interference, and then rings of bright um, maxima again, that's our constructive interference. And so if you were to take a slice through here and look at the intensity of the light across the midpoint of here, we it looks kind of similar to our single slit experiment. We've got a broad width and a bunch of, um, of, of dark fringes and bright fringes on either side of that. And of course, we have some equations to describe this um, diffraction pattern from a circular aperture. So we have this equation, which helps us with that. This angle theta sub one here, that angle locates the first minimum, the first dark ring in the intensity for a circular aperture of diameter D. So our first minima, the angle, the angular position of our first minima equals 1.22. <laughs> It's, it was not an integer anymore, times the wavelength divided by big D, where big D is the diameter of your circular opening. Okay, And we also call this the Rayleigh criterion. And um, this is an important criterion, especially when I'm an astronomer. So it's an important criterion for us to think about when we're thinking about how well telescopes can resolve distant objects. So here we have like, the bird's eye view of our um, circular aperture diffraction. Here's our circular hole of diameter D. We've got our screen on the other side where we have this beautiful pattern of concentric, dark and bright, constructive and, inter and destructive interference fringes. And uh, we've got our central maximum here. So that angle theta, if we could draw a straight line between our opening and our screen, that angle theta is this angle that locates the angular position of our first order you know, dark spot or dark ring away from the central point of our bright maxima. Okay, So that angle theta here is what we're getting at. Now this angle theta is going to be given to us in radians with this equation. So you, your, your, your values that you're going, to, you're going to use for wavelength here and d on the bottom the diameter of that hole need to be in the same unit in order for them to perfectly cancel. And then this will give us our answer for that angle in radians, okay? And um, we can convert from radians to degrees by taking radians and multiplying it by 180 divided by pi, 180 degrees divided by pi. Now this is just the angle theta um, this angle described in this uh, graphic here. So the width of our central maxima on the screen at the distance away from the aperture is also twice y, like what we were talking about with our uh, single slit diffraction pattern. And that's also equal to 2.44 times the wavelength times the distance between our slit and our screen divided by the width of our aperture, big capital D. Okay. Um, so this central width for the circular aperture is a bit bigger than for our single slit. The equation we derived for the width for our single slit diffraction pattern was just two times the wavelength times the distance between slit and screen divided by the width of our slit. This time it's just a little bit bigger, 2.44 because of the circular nature of the, um, of the aperture. Now in this image, this first image on the left, 
we have a diffraction pattern of a single point source through a circular aperture. Now let's say instead of one bright source, we have two bright sources and they're very close to each other, but we're still looking at those two bright sources through the same aperture, okay? Then we see two point sources producing these diffraction patterns, these circular diffraction patterns that overlap um, in this case, we're still able to kind of tell that those are maybe two separate points. But then as those two point sources get closer and closer together, so as you take those two point sources and bring them closer and closer together, um, their diffraction pattern starts to merge together. And at some point, you're no longer going to be able to tell those two things apart from each other. Okay, so uh, a similar thing happens, like imagine you're looking um, through a telescope, okay? Here's the aperture of my telescope, and I've got two distant bright point sources, those are stars, and they're separated from each other by some angular separation, we're going to call that angle theta, okay? And then when I look at those two distant stars through my aperture in my telescope, I get a diffraction pattern because we're looking at those stars through a circular opening. Here's the diffraction pattern from one of those stars. Here's the diffraction pattern from the other star. Okay, these stars are far enough away that their diffraction patterns do not overlap with each other. But if those stars are closer together in the sky, closer together in the sky, then their diffraction patterns are going to get closer and closer and overlap to the point where we cannot tell them apart from each other, okay? And this is all that our ability to resolve these distant objects is all dependent on the fact that we've got a circular aperture, we've got this diffraction pattern and the width of that um, opening, the width of that entrance helps us figure out how far away can two points be from each other for us to still be able to tell them apart. The same thing is happening in our eyes when we look at two distant sources, we're so far away from them that two things in the distance appear to kind of merge together and you can't tell them apart. That's because that diffraction pattern that we are getting through our eyes, through our opening in our eyes, is such that um, those diffraction patterns from those two point sources are overlapping on each other and we can't tell them apart. If we get closer to those things, their angular separation becomes larger and then we're better able to resolve them. Okay, so that's what's happening inside our eyes. We're gonna use that here in a minute. In order for two individual points to be resolved, in order for two distant objects, for us to be able to tell them apart from each other, their angular separation must be at least the Rayleigh criterion or larger. That was our equation that we saw earlier for, um, the, the angular separation between our central bright point and our circular aperture diffraction in our first dark fringe. Okay, so in order to tell these distant objects apart, their angular separation has to be equal to, this angular separation in radian, has to be equal to this 1.22 wavelength divided by D, where D is the diameter of the aperture. So if you're thinking about your eyeball, D is the diameter of the pupil in your eye because that's the opening for light to come through in your eye. So again, this is important for telescopes, microscopes, and our eyes. Now this idea we're going to apply for your uh, discussion this week. We're going to think about the resolution of the human eye. So you have an experiment. We're going to draw two lines on a white sheet of paper. So take, you know, just any white sheet of paper and draw two vertical lines attach it to the wall. Um, you want them to be separated only by like a few millimeters or maybe even a centimeter, but nothing more than that. Then you're going to walk away from those lines. At what maximum distance can you be away from those two lines that you drew on that paper and still be able to distinguish those two lines? Okay, so if you're close, you know, close enough, to those, um, to those vertical lines, then those lines are resolved for your eye. The angular separation of those is greater than the Rayleigh criterion. If you step really, really, really far back and you can no longer tell those individual lines apart, 
that means that their angular separation is smaller than the Rayleigh criterion. So their diffraction patterns are overlapping in your eyeball and that's why you can't tell them apart. But we're gonna find the just right distance where you're gonna, you're gonna step away from those lines and just be on the verge of being able to resolve them. So you're gonna have two quantities. You're gonna have the distance between those lines that you drew and how far away you have to be from those lines in order for you to distinguish them apart. So those are two pieces of data you're gonna collect. And just with those two pieces of data, what does this tell us about the size of your pupil by thinking about the Rayleigh criterion? Can you be quantitative? So you're gonna use this information to figure out what D is here, big D, in our equation for the Rayleigh criterion. Now here I have some hints to help you think about this, okay? Maybe it's a little bit overwhelming, it's very open-ended. That's okay, that's good, so that we can get you thinking um, more creatively and more broadly about problems that don't necessarily have an exact number. We're doing some estimation here, okay? We're gonna think about those two lines on the wall as our light sources being viewed through our circular aperture of our eyeballs. Um, big D, that's the diameter of our pupil. This is what we're trying to estimate. Um, think about our necessary conditions for the Rayleigh criterion. So those two um, objects are gonna be separated by just the right angle, which is equal to 1.22 wavelength over big D. Um, you can pick something in the visible wavelength of light for lambda here, whatever you want that to be, whether it's red or green or purple or something, it's just, you know, our eyes see in the visible. So this wavelength of light here needs to be in the visible part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So what we don't really know is how can you get at this angle theta here from the geometry of your experiment? All right, so here we have our head, here we have the wall. All right, so this is gonna be similar to kind of the geometry we've been working through in our problems um, the past few mini lectures. I'm gonna draw a straight line between my eyeball and the center point between those two lines I drew, those two vertical lines I drew, okay? And I'm gonna call Y the distance between the center point between those lines and where any one of those lines happens to be. So this is Y here. And then you could call L, I guess, or X, this distance between your head and the wall, which you're estimating whenever you step back from the wall until those points are no longer resolved. So then you've got two legs of a right angle triangle that you have quantities for from your experiment. So you've got this leg and you've got that leg, okay? And then we've got this little angle in here that I'm gonna call alpha, okay? So you could say, use sine, cosine, or tangent, whatever you, I'm gonna purposely not tell you the correct answer, you know, the exact answer here. You're gonna think about it. How are we gonna get the angle alpha in this little drawing from this distance y and this distance x, okay? How do we get this angle alpha? And then the angle theta in this equation here is twice this angle alpha. And then, um, so this angle theta is your angular separation between those two points. So this kind of geometry that I just described is how you find the angular separation between these points. So in the discussion, you're gonna think about this, you're gonna synthesize it, you're gonna explain in words how you're going to use all of this information in order to get at the diameter of the human pupil. Now we know that it's, I actually, I'm gonna tell you, it's somewhere between two to four millimeters is the diameter of our pupil. And so you're gonna figure out how we get to that number using good physics <laughs> and using good um, description.